everyone. Literally just finished stop typing my script as we just get to the end of the credits. Welcome to the happy day one. Help if I read it, wouldn't it? Happy day one of a bright and shiny new parliament. Welcome to the news agenda with me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by the Mirror's North East reporter, Jeremy Armstrong. Morning, Jez. Good morning. Now, this is the People's Paper Review, so get into the comments, everyone. Ask us your questions. We'll do our best to answer them for you. Those of you listening later on podcast will just have to pretend it's day one of a bright new dawn for you as well. So what have we got for you today? Well, the mirror has splashed on the expectations for the England team uh, ahead of tonight's semi-final in the Euros with manager Gareth Southgate hailing uh, the bond of brothers for the spirit in the team ahead of the big match. Now, for any fans out there, uh, you might be interested to know that the Brewer Green King is offering to give every customer a free drink if England scores tonight. Perhaps that's because they haven't been scoring very many so far in the tournament. But uh, what could possibly go wrong for the Green King PR department by giving people free booze? Who does, knows? That include, does that include penalty shootouts, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's five drinks straight away. Yeah, Hopefully. but uh, it, you know that's what their PR has been e- emailing out to thousands of journalists this morning, so I thought I'd give them a mention. Now, first, Jeremy has got a story in the paper today, and I'm going to warn you now, it's quite a horrifying one to read. Uh, I think it's one we all ought to hear about. If you are easily upset by grisly news stories, maybe just mute it for 10 minutes or so and come back to us later. Jeremy, can you take us through what this is all about, please? Yeah, I, I think it's probably the worst string drive um, case which I've ever covered in, in 31 years on the paper. It's a story of a man who uh, arrived at Newcastle Airport in the early hours of the morning, having been on a holiday in Turkey, decided for some reason, known only to himself, to set off on a journey to Yorkshire. He's from Rotherham when he was inebriated um, and was weaving in and out of traffic, was witnessed in the early hours of the morning around about 2 33 o'clock the crossing gates at my hometown going along the found bypass for people who are, uh, have knowledge of that route and that road uh, and ended up catching up with a, a lady who just literally had just picked up a, a sister at the airport and had a little baby boy in the back of the car. And he, for some reason known only to himself, took a picture of his dashboard at 141 miles an hour in the moments before he, um, he, he drove into the back of this lady's vehicle and... Um, the impact was devastating, killed her uh, baby son, eight-month-old Zachary Warner, um, killed her auntie, a lady called Carlene, who just um, qualified as uh, an air hostess. It had actually come back from holiday to start a, a dream job and left uh, and left mum desperately seeking both of them because the uh, the impact had thrown them um, free of the wreckage. So it was, it was an incredibly emotional hearing yesterday. Uh, she gave a statement directly in front of the man who was responsible for her child's death. The partner of um, her sister demanded that he look at him when he was making his statement. Um, and there were about 50 people inside the court, you know, support as family members. Really, really just the most appalling case I've ever come across, I think. Yeah, no, it's just saying that in the paper. At one point, the mum who had, had survived the crash was sort of searching through the wreckage immediately afterwards, looking for her eight month old. She was picking up pieces of car to see if he was underneath and then, and sort of waving down people to try and help. And eventually, a, a lorry driver who'd stopped sort of said, He's over here, he's on the verge. And she, she grabbed him and gave him a big hug. Um, now you were in court, Jeremy, for all this. It must have been very traumatic for you to listen to as well. And, and it so- is. I think, I think, yeah, I, I was in tears. Everyone was in tears listening to the mum's account. It's just horrific. Uh, just to it's- have to listen to the evidence and have to process it all and everything else, even though you're not part of it. When you're a journalist, it's <clears throat> it is still very affecting. How did the driver react during the trial at the verdict when the when the partner was saying, "Look at me when I'm giving my statement"? Did he offer any explanation for any of this? He was sh- he was shaking. I mean, it, it was it was a, a a terrible terrible account. I mean, he, he basically tried to lie about picking picking up a hitchhiker because he realised what he'd done. He said that he picked up a hitchhiker and that you know the hitchhiker was driving and then disappeared at the time of the crash. And of course, his DNA was found on the airbag. Um, I think he obviously realised that he wasn't going to get away with those lies and did admit to it um, in the end. But you know. It's just, it's just what he did, isn't it? The choices he made, 
why he was taking pictures. He made some reference to having a, a row on holiday with his wife and finding a new wife. Why he decided to take a picture of the dashboard 141 miles an hour? Was he going to send it to somebody? Was he going to um, try and make some sort of show out of it? I just I have no idea. Yeah. But he claims to drink drive limit at the side of the road. And the repercussions of what he did were just absolutely um, devastating. Uh, I don't know how, what else one can say, really. Yeah. You know, the, the baby's life lost, our auntie's life lost, all those lives ruined. Um, and the, the lady, um, Shalona's sister, um, she was a mum. So the partner was obviously talking about their daughter uh, and, the, and the dad of both of them, both Shalona and Colleen, the granddad of the Ben Zachary was given his account as well and just taking that phone call in the early hours of the morning from his daughter describing that. You just cannot imagine that. That's it's just there, really are, there, are, there are no words for it. And there's a life sentence now for drink driving. Yeah, Emily says, don't drink drive. He needs to be jailed. I mean, he has been. What's the sentence that he's got? He got, he got it's not tagged on the end, isn't it? He got 17 years and three months. I mean, the judge made the point that one cannot, in the sentence... Uh, make up for the loss and I accept that entirely but I, I I do find it staggering that he wasn't given a life sentence and I also find it staggering that he wasn't like, banned from driving for life he's banned from driving for 21 years I think under these fairly complicated guidelines that they have now um, I don't know I think if you were a member if you knew of the family of the victims if you knew the family of your own court actually listen to that that evidence the scale the culpability was so high I'm really, really astonished that um, he wasn't banned from driving for life. Yeah. And it's, it's as well, I mean, he's picked up his car at the airport. Did he get it from like a, a, a valley service, just pick it up? It was, from a, it was a meet and yeah, meet. And and yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a meet and greet. I mean, that was covered. Um, he's given him right? the keys when he's yeah. in it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it was said that although he was behaving erratically, that it, he didn't appear to be inebriated. Um no, he had a bottle. The thing, is, the thing is, he had a bottle of vodka. Well, a bottle of vodka was found in the vicinity of the wreckage. So whether he's driving while he was while he, while he, whether he's actually drinking while he was driving, if that makes sense, uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Only he knows how much alcohol he had. Yeah. Um, but, but he was three times the limit in the breath test, and he was two times the limit in the blood test. Yeah. And so. Steve's yeah, normally you can tell, can't you? Steve says his driving badge should be lifelong. It's such a tragic story. Now, at this stage, I usually ask something like, you know, well, what happens next as a result of all this? But, you know, with this kind of case, the answer is usually nothing very much. You know, this guy's going to jail for a long time. He'll be banned from driving for a long time when he gets out. Zachary's gone. Carlene's gone. The family is devastated. Probably never going to be able to heal that gap that's in their lives now. And people are going to keep on speeding, won't they? I mean, Jeremy, can you see any reason, because I can't, aside from whether or not, you know, it, it should be a criminal offence to let someone drive, to give someone their, if you have their car keys, to physically let them have the car keys when they're drunk. But can you see any reason why it's legal to sell a car that is capable of doing 140 miles an hour to anybody? They sell speed limiters on van and lorries and trucks. Why don't we have speed limiters on civilian cars i mean it's, it's a when, when one hears cases like this because of the extreme nature of the behavior you do tend to think of extreme measures and i, and I can understand that completely i you know 141 miles an hour while 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 you know taking footage of it on his mobile phone he'd also been sending messages on whatsapp yeah. what can you what can you say about that behavior yeah. Is the judge is the judge said he took he risked the life of every man, woman, and child who he who he passed that night when he left the airport. And um in answer to your question about speedometers, I mean and how that would work, I, I don't know. It would be one for the motoring industry. It's such an extreme case that I just you know, I don't know. Why would one you know, obviously all these high performance cars now are capable of doing well in excess of 100 miles an hour. So, but why? There's no way you can drive them at that speed. The limit's 70. Um, and, you know, if you if you want to go and go around a racetrack for a day, uh, you can get in a race car and do it. If, if you want to train as a police officer and chase someone very fast down the motorway, I don't mind you having a 140-mile-an-hour car because you probably need it to catch, like, the murderer. But... No one, none of us, my car goes up to 130 or something. I've never done it, obviously, but it's there on the speedometer. And yours is probably the same, Joe. 
none of us need to go that speed. I don't know why it's legal to sell a car that can go that fast because I cannot see any reason. It's like I'm, selling I'm going to Europe, I'm going to Europe and there's, there's, a, there's not a speed limit in Germany. I guess the argument would be if you if you buy a German car, if you're going to if you're going to Germany, you know, you Germany, might you, you... go to Germany then. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm not allowed I, to say that. I, I, I understand. I understand in the context of this case why you would feel that way. Yeah, I do tend to think that there's just no earthly good reason for it. People only abuse it and are idiots because human beings are, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, thank you for taking us through that, Jeremy. Um, now, uh, let us know. Have you got any questions? What do you think about mandatory speed limits or speed limiters on uh, motor vehicles for civilians? 70 miles an hour max, and that's a bit excessive. Can be sometimes, yeah, um, says Sutcliffe. Uh, now, what do you think? Do you think that there should be, you know, should be illegal to sell cars that can go that fast? Get into the comments and let us know. Now, inside the paper, it's the main story of the day, which it has been for weeks now, which, of course, is politics. Yesterday, MPs and peers were sworn in for the start of a new parliament, and it's officially the most diverse group of representatives we've ever managed to send there. There are 90 MPs from ethnic minorities, 63% of them uh, of MPs were state educated, 62 we think are LGBTQ+, and there's a record number of women, 263 for the first time. But it's got to be said, that's only 40% of the MPs in the chamber are women. There are many more ethnic minority and gay people as a proportion of the population than there are in the chamber. And there's still 37% of those MPs who are privately educated, which is about 10 times what it is outside parliament. But let's try and be a bit positive about it. Jeremy, what, what difference do you think it will make that the Commons now looks a bit more like us commoners? Yeah, I think I think it's crucial actually in terms of debate, in terms of the the breadth of debate, in terms of the views that you get. Um, if you look at Germany, which has got proportional representation, they've got far more Greens, they've got a far more, and you know, powerful environmental lobby. My my kids certainly believe that's the most important thing, the most important question of our age actually. Uh, when you look at the impact on, of of the kind of laws that are being passed on the environment, uh, some would say that that you know maybe the Greens weren't represented enough to a certain extent. But I think you've got to be positive about it, haven't you? You know, the Team GB, I've just done a story on the fact that they're sending more uh, women than men for the, only the second time in our history. To have more female MPs, it's got, it's got to enlighten the process, I think. I, they, they, they may be thinking about, you know, in terms of Parliament itself, you know, they're all, already trying to ameliorate conditions within um, the institution for women MPs, for people who've got kids, you know. And if you've got that, I, I, one would imagine that's going to be more progressive in terms of laws, in terms of thinking about that, you know, the the, the balance, the work-life balance for parents, how women have to juggle so much in order to look after kids and have a career. All those sorts of things, I think, feed into in, into into lawmaking. I sincerely hope so, anyway. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it, there's a broader question also of it kind of being a, a new era for the country, which certainly was very powerful on... On Thursday night, I was at Rishi Sunak's count and found myself interviewing a man uh, dressed as a bin. Oh, um, I was doing that on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> he was on the show. He's quite, he's quite an interesting chap, isn't he, camping yeah. face? Um, but then I came back. So it, it, what, what was amazing about it, I think, was he walks out sort of stage left and then I came back into the room where the journalists were and there was Keir Starmer on screen, you know, celebrating this incredible victory. And what you're seeing now... It, I know it sounds bizarre, but you don't really think about it until you see it in that amazing shot of them all together, you know, 600 mm -hmm. lot of them crammed into Parliament. You so rarely see it full, let's be honest. Yeah. But it really makes you think. on the benches, I saw. Red yeah, jackets. Yeah. yeah. It really makes you think about it, doesn't it? It's, yeah. it's reality. It does, um, yeah. Now, but, um, for the, the shot we just had there of Keir Starmer with some MPs outside Downing Street, I think those were the Scottish MSPs, so slightly less diverse than the than Parliament itself. Um, Steve says it is progress. It reflects the population better than previous parliaments. There's still a long way to go. There is some work to do. It's got to be said. Um, and just on the point of uh, modernising Parliament and so on, Jeremy, I understand that Rachel Reeves or the Chancellor's personal loo in the Treasury has a urinal in it. And so one of the things they've had, I don't know why, the that damn thing stink. Um, but they've they've had one of the things they've had to do is give her an actual proper sit-down toilet. Um, why on earth uh we haven't done that a long time ago is beyond me. Why the Treasury's kitted out like a pub, for goodness sake, I'm not sure. But 
That's one of the things I've had to do, just put in proper actual hygienic toilet equipment. If only everyone could do that. The winds, the winds of change. The winds of change. <laughs> exactly, yes. Um, now, speaking of urinals and also diversity, um, here's someone who isn't uh, diverse at all. Uh, Nigel Farage and his four other uh, reform MPs all marched to Parliament yesterday, brought their own photographer, generally treating it as they did the EU Parliament, which is uh, like a grand old game. In the House, as you can see there, he's on his feet speaking. Now, this is the point where a speaker has been chosen, and by convention, there's speaker then asks each party leader to stand up and make a short speech you're supposed to be nice to the speaker make some jokes you know Farage did refer to the fact that he finally got in after a long time of waiting but then he moved straight on to criticizing John Burkow who isn't even an MP or a speaker anymore and wanging on about Brexit for a bit and we haven't got the clip but um the man the MP sitting next to Nigel obviously not a fan just sat there and rolled his eyes like oh god he's off already um it just, you know, carking back to the past and banging on about something everyone else has moved on from now. Jeremy, how do you think uh, Nigel's time in Parliament's going to go? How is your journalistic spidey sense tingling? Where's it, where's, where's it going from here, the story, do you think? Uh, I feel very conflicted by it, uh, to, be, to be honest. I mean, my hope would be that he'd become more and more relevant because Labour have such a huge majority. And the only reason that he, 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 he got the platform that he did, in my opinion anyway, is because of this Tory battle with the right and their, their desire to try and placate the right. And obviously that's why we ended up with a Brexit vote. And that's the only reason he got any kind of platform, in my opinion. Um, I would love to think he just becomes more and more relevant. That's my, that's my hope. Um, <laughs> Do you but, think he will, but, but, you have, but, you have to, but you have to accept that, you know. They, they, they did get millions of votes from a very, very, you know, slow start. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I, I don't know is the honest answer. Time, time will tell. My instinct is that that, that will happen because of the, the Labour agenda, hopefully, you know, being successful and sweeping across the country and people becoming less obsessed about this question of immigration, which is, you know, what's happening in France is a terrible, terrible thing. But in terms of all the problems we've got in the world, in terms of, you know, war in Ukraine, the energy bills, the cost of living crisis, defence, you know, all of those key issues in terms of everyday life. You know, the number of people coming in through immigration doesn't really impact us on a day-to-day -day basis, despite what he says. And, and there are many, many negative aspects to, to Brexit, which he denies in terms of our, you know, our ability to export, the impact on trade, the impact on the NHS, our inability to get people to come and stay here now and work because of this perception that they're no longer welcome and the problems for people coming into the country, the positivity of, of migration instead of the negativity of it. Of mm. course we need to sort that out. Of course we need to sort out people coming across the, the channel because it's inhumane apart from anything else. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, as I was saying earlier in terms of environment, water quality, you know, standard of living, all the things which really impinge on everyday life, it's not the issue that it's 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 said to be, particularly by him. Yeah, well, hopefully, if you do have a sort of an era of grown-up politics, that people who act a bit more childishly get exposed as being more childish. What do you think, everybody? Do you think immigration is a big issue, and it is still going to be a big uh, sort of bugbear for the next parliament? How do you think the Conservatives are going to react to having Farage on the back benches? He's obviously going to be working hard to undermine them and trying to make them more like he would like them to be. Are they going to go that way, do you think? Let us know. Get into the comments, because poor Steve here is doing all the work this morning. Um, Steve says, Parliament is a platform for Farage to show out of touch and irrelevant he really is. It's the beginning of the end for him. I think we'll see perhaps when the first by-elections come along, um, you know, at some point maybe in the middle or towards the end of the Parliament, when you have, uh, you know, perhaps in places where reform was in a very strong second place, which was a lot of places, in the general election and whether or not that actually translates in a year or two's time to being able to take seats at a by-election. If they can, then they're, you know, they're still a, an important political force. If by that point, you know, whatever the government has done or whatever the Conservatives have done have pushed reform further back from second place, then uh, Jeremy and Steve will have what they wish for and he'll become more irrelevant. Leslie says, don't you think Farage is totally out of touch? 
if he's banging on about John Burkow and Brexit, I would say very much so, yes. But there's a lot of the country that are still quite obsessed with Brexit. Musical Man says immigration is a massive issue for working people, some working people, perhaps. If, on the other hand, you, you're working and want to, you know, also go to A&E and have someone look after you, uh, I think you're probably quite happy for some more immigration if they're the ones who are going to be uh, wiping the blood if you need. Um, now, uh, Mark says Farage will be out before the next election. Who knows? Maybe the first by-election will be his in Clacton. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? That one will be worth getting the popcorn for. Now, um, Labour has hit the ground running, as they promised before the election. So Chancellor Rachel Reeves, uh, in between sorting out her urinal, has set up a sovereign wealth fund to attract three times as much money in investment into the country. Wes Streeting's been in talks with junior doctors about their pay dispute, which has led to two years of strikes already and lots of problems in the NHS. And work's also started on weekend and evening GP and hospital appointments. But at this stage, Jeremy, that's all words, of course. It's, it's stuff they've said and we don't know, you know, whether that sovereign wealth fund is going to attract that other investment in. We don't know if they are going to be able to settle the junior doctor strike. We don't know if you will get enough appointments at the evenings and weekends. How long do you think it'll be before we do see some results from some of this stuff? Because that's what they're trying to do in the first hundred days is get some quick wins. Um, and how long do you think it'll be before voters go, well, I want to see some some results for this, please? Mm. I mean, I think regrettably it is going to be a slow burn. I don't think there's any two ways any two ways about it. I, I think the the housing thing's really really um, interesting, isn't it? Because the reason I say it's slow burn obviously it takes a long time, you know, to build the houses. But I think there is a, a real. There's no question whatsoever. There's a huge demand there, and if these planning these new planning laws do work, the you know the house builders are desperate to do it. So it's it's kind of like it's it's releasing the land, which is the key, and that's what they're endeavouring to do. And I think that's quite exciting. I think. Some of the things like the energy, you know, the the the, the big energy company that they're talking about, um, what kind of powers that's going to have, how that's really going to work, I, I, I just, I'm not sure about it. And, and the Defence Secretary was on this morning on the Today programme talking about, you know, the reality of how, you know, the situation that they've inherited to a certain extent. And that's not making an excuse, you know, it has been cut to the bone. You know, the Defence Forces now are at Napoleonic levels, i.e., it as you know... I only one arm. <laughs> the smallest they've been since then, yeah. So yeah. the war starts about invading the Falklands. Yes, we could invade the Falklands, but no, we couldn't stay there because we haven't got enough people. We just literally haven't got enough soldiers. Yeah. Now, that that let's be honest about it, that requires money. If you're going to get more soldiers, you've got to pay them. You've got to have proper accommodation. You've got to have proper you know, support for them. Otherwise, there's no point in them being there. So that's going to, that's going to involve some kind of investment. Now, as they, as they stressed... Right throughout the election campaign, they're not going to do that until they get growth. And so, you know, the reality is we could have quite a wait. Yeah. Now, the correct joke, of course, when someone says troops are at Napoleon levels is to say, are they a bit short? <laughs> <laughs> Just sorry, I thought it was too damn late. I had to say it. Um, <laughs> So you've got this issue now where you've got these first hundred days. They've got that managed to make just losing stuff. Look at that, he's corpsing. Um, you've got this first hundred days where they where they want to achieve some big stuff, but you may not see the results of that like five years, ten years down the road before they, they start trickling through. Someone else might be able to take credit for it, and they also need to have some very short, quick wins to do stuff right now so it looks like things are happening while you're waiting for the other stuff to tick in. So they've got to try and do both. Um, I mean, what do you think, everybody? Do you think that this is going to make a big difference? How long are you going to give it before you want to start seeing more dentists, more doctors, school, schools actually safe to go and play in, that kind of thing? Let us know. Um, now, Keir has finished announcing his uh, government ministers, and there are some surprises. Steve here says, dump the Rwanda plan, negotiate the junior doctors and release land for housing. It's 3-0 if you do that. Well, he's, he's done that. Those are the first things he's done. Um, now, Keir, as I said, has finished announcing his government ministers. There's some surprises. There's about three people who have only just become MPs last Thursday who are already given a ministerial job, including one of them, a former colonel in the Royal Marines called Al Carnes, who is now veterans minister on my target list, therefore, uh, with zero political experience. I think he has done some work in sort of national security infrastructure and so on. But, Jim, you know, he's not been in Westminster and, and 
been quite aware of how it all works for before. Meanwhile, there's some seasoned hands who've been kicked to the curb. People like Emily Thornbury, uh, who had a lot of shadow cabinet roles. I think she was a minister as well in the, the Brown government. Um, did a lot of the long, hard slog in opposition, doing the interviews on the airwaves, in the party, that kind of stuff, and has not been rewarded with a cabinet job. Now, the Mirror Politics newsletter this morning, which I recommend you all sign up to, it's written by Jason Beatty, who comes on this show sometimes, he says that overlooked MPs can become restless MPs. And he's got, Keir now has got 412 people to try to keep happy. There's big potential for causing some upsets and just having, you know, constant undercurrent of rebellion somewhere in there. Where do you stand, Jeremy, um, as someone who's got like me, 30 years of experience under your belt, um, grizzled old reporters, uh, where do you stand on giving the interns, you know, the jobs and overlooking uh, the, the, the those who might know a little bit more about how things work? Yeah, I mean, you know, with the veterans men say, you can see why they've done it, you can see his experience, why that's relevant, that's obviously going to play well with the people who he's dealing with, I would have thought, you've got to balance that up with, you know, the experience, he's got experienced people around him and I'm sure will help. My overriding feeling, I've got to admit, is that I think they've waited for such a long time that, mm. you know, I think that's going to give them, that there is going to be a fair amount of, I don't know what best describes it, but certainly within the party that he's got a, he's got an awful lot in the bank, hasn't he? Really. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm sure that, 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 that has to, that has to um, be true even for people like Emily Thornbury. I mean, she was particularly generous, I thought, in, um, the the statement that she made, she was obviously a, she must have been extraordinarily disappointed to miss out, but she's and, and she was one of the few you know veterans in terms of the shadow cabinet who did really. Um, but over the overriding feeling is one of of kind of excitement at the prospect of power, I think, and and I think that will because it was such a staggering result. If you think about where they were four years ago with Jeremy Corbyn, four and a half years ago. And the the landslide with Boris Johnson. I know I know the Tories were catastrophic, so I I, I don't think one can underestimate that. But nonetheless, it, it is no mean achievement to do what he's done, and I think he's got a lot of I think he's got a lot of um, you know brownie points if one can put it that way. Yeah, exactly. A lot of those four hundred twelve MPs are going to have a lot of loyalty to him because, like our Kongs, they've been elected because of Keir Starmer, basically, and so they're going to have an awful lot of support for him. But then there's going to be some who. Um, uh, perhaps you know are going to be future leadership contenders people who are perhaps slightly unhappy with one particular policy or another who are going to start agitating from the back benches and he can't buy them all off with a government job because he's got so many MPs and only so many government jobs to hand out yeah so he's going to have party management problems I would have thought at some point probably halfway through the parliament is going to start getting a bit shaky but we'll have to see won't we how it all goes right what do you think everybody anyway how do you feel about the speeding drivers how do you feel about um Keir and his prospects for party management in the future are you positive about the way uh labor is looking or would you like them to do something specific right now uh do get into the comments and let us know but in the meantime uh we've got found some good news in the world for you which i think we really needed today and here it is i think Oh, the button was broken. Let's stick it, hit it twice. Now, if there's a theme to today's show, it is, I think, about taking more care about things and each other. And arguably, that's where the long years of Tory austerity really failed to maintain any support, never mind maintain the public services. Well, the chalk horse at Uffington in Oxfordshire is not a public service. It doesn't help anyone very much. And the only growth it's had of late is that the grass has been covering it up. But for the past year, volunteers have been cutting it back and restoring this 3,000 year old outline made by Neolithic Oxfordians for reasons best known only to them. <laughs> Now it's back to its former glory, doing nothing much at all, while also being rather marvellous. Jeremy, is this proof that if you take care of what seem to be perhaps the unimportant things, then the whole world can just be an immeasurably better, nicer place? Yeah, I mean, I, what, what I love about that story, and it's kind of um, tucked away to a certain degree, is it's actually local people over thousands of years who looked after it. Not, and not just in the modern era, I mean, we're talking about going back to the Bronze Age pretty much, so... I, I do find that that kind of restores your faith in human nature a little bit, doesn't it? The fact that the evolved fellow is important and, you know, the recent restoration is just the latest chapter in that very, very long story. So I couldn't agree more. I think it's great. I think it's brilliant. It's been, it's been kept um, for such a long time, essentially, by local people, really. 
Yeah, there's several sort of chalk outlines, aren't there, around the country, uh, which just about survive. And it is, it's, it's local people once a year grab the spade, right? I'm off up the horse. And they go with a little turf cutter and, and just trim it up and just look after it because someone's done that for thousands of years. So you probably ought to keep doing it. And for no good reason, except it's there and it's nice. And it Excellent. Works. Yeah. <sighs> it's wonderful actually so um thank you very much jeremy for taking us through all that thank you everyone for taking part thank you very much to steve who's done a lot of the tapping this morning um and we will see you all again next monday for another edition of the news agenda if you're listening on podcast please leave us a review so other people can find us till then everybody take care no speeding and tatty bye thank you very much